Okay, where do uh, IP addresses come from? They come from uh, IANA, right? Which is the body that's responsible for managing all of the IP addresses around the world. And IANA sort of like uh, distributes responsibility of these IP addresses to regions, okay? And you see on the uh, screen there those particular regions. So if you live in the United States and you need an IP address, your ISP will more than likely petition Aaron to get an IP address. Let's um, bring up a web browser and actually surf IANA's website. I'll do that for you. I go to IANA.org. We're at IANA.org, and we're concerned with IPv4, so I'm going to go to IP addresses and AS numbers, and we'll talk about AS numbers in a different class. Here are those uh, regional bodies that I mentioned earlier. Okay, we could actually click the Internet Protocol version 4 address space, and we'll see the IP address ranges and what organization or companies that those ranges are assigned to. We see according to this chart, um, Ford basically owns anything that begins with a 19. Okay. Defense information systems, anything that begins with a 26. Well, you can delete the leading zero. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Uh huh. Okay, and we see Aaron. The United States falls under Aaron, right? Okay. So Aaron's responsible for 63 through 76. Now here at Pitt, this particular classroom public IP address is 71.214.1.65, I believe. And to prove my point, we'll bring up a browser and I'll type in, let's see, what's my IP address? Okay. See, my IP address is 71.1.214.65, all right? Yeah, but if you were to do a config, oh, our IP config on this particular workstation, you'll see that the machine sees this workstation as 172.30.213 and dot whatever the host address is. That is a private IP address that we use inside of the, of the local area network. But the rest of the world will see these PCs as 71.1.214.65, okay? Because we're using that. And we talk about that briefly in another class. Okay, let's go back to the Aaron site or uh, IANA site. Okay. 71. 71. We see 71, right? Anything that begins with the 71 falls on the errand, okay? But however, Pitt does not directly talk to Aaron. Our ISP is Embark. So we know the Embark has gotten part of the 71 um, IP address space from Aaron, okay? And that leads me to my next point, which is the IP address structure is hierarchical. Hierarchical. It falls into tiers. At the top, you'll probably have something known as the tier one ISP, such as Sprint or Embark. And uh, Embark will issue IP addresses to a tier two ISP. And then we could go from a tier two ISP directly to a business or a large organization, such as Pitt Community College or ECU. Or we could go to a tier three, and a tier three basically uh, gets is IP addresses from the tier two, and the tier three generally deals with residents, okay? Smaller markets, all right? Let's play with this example for a little bit. 
we see that uh, the tier one ISP is Sprint. In this example, that Sprint owns anything that begins with 194. Now, this is just for de demonstrative purposes. These are not actual IP addresses assigned to actual organizations. All right, and we see that Beagle ISP is, uh, well, falls under uh, Sprint, and it has anything that begins with 194.1. Okay. Beagle, in essence, can issue IP addresses to its customers, um, and the customer's IP address will start with 194.1, and then the third octet will be the unique octet that's uh, assigned to that particular customer. We see that big auto sales falls under um, Beagle. The IP address is 194.1.2.0. Basically, anything that starts with 194.1.2 belongs to Beagle Auto Sales. Anything that starts with 194.1.3 belongs to Happy Incorporated. Now, this leads to another interesting point. Sometimes we we wonder how it is possible to find out who actually sent something that across the web that shouldn't have been sent. Well, you just find out. You know, you look at the hierarchical structure to find out, okay, who owns this particular IP address, and you just drill down from that point until you get to the actual device. Okay. Okay, you brought up a good question. Why is the slash increasing? Uh, that gets into what we call a summarization. That's a little beyond the scope of what we're talking about in this class. But however, as we get into subnetting, you'll probably see how that becomes uh, relevant. Summarization is basically. Um, so that's not the slash. Well, first of all, we know that the slash notation can be mapped to a dotted decimal. Okay, so basically we're saying in, in the Sprint case, the first bit, that 255, indicates the network address. Okay, but then as we branch out, if, we all, if, if eventually we're going to funnel back to Sprint at the top, then we have to somewhat bloom out the, at the bottom. So the further we get away from Sprint, that mass is going to increase. It keeps dividing that major network. More branches on the tree. Exactly. Exactly. I was just trying to figure out why. Yep. Because we see that the slash 16 is telling us that the first 16 bits. Of, it's a class B in this instance, but this is also telling us the first 16 bits. Of the IP address consists of the network portion of the IP address. Okay. Then, as we get to big auto sales, we see that the first 24 bits of the IP address consists of the network address. Right. The further we get away from the the trunk. Yeah. Uh huh. Very good question. Thanks for that. Okay. Let's kind of uh, apply this. I'm going to use Packet Tracer. Okay, we see uh, big auto sales. Okay, and this is the border router that's connected to big auto sales, and it's directly connected to the tier two ISP, which happens to be Beagle, right? Okay, and Beagle is in essence uh, connected to the mother, the, which is Sprint in this instance. Let's see what IP address has been assigned to F0 slash 0 interface. No IP address. Hmm. Okay. Let's check on uh, the Beagle router. Okay, Beagle router IP address is 194.1.0.1. And it's a slash 24. We see the, the 255, 255, 255. Okay. So that tells us that this last octet is basically used for host addresses. It's the first 24 used for network address. And we need to assign an appropriate IP address to this outside interface, which is F0 slash 0 of the big auto sales router. What would be an appropriate IP address? Mm 
an appropriate IP address would be 194.1. Okay, what was the other? Let's take a look at it. Okay. The ISP IP address is 194.1.0.1, right? So then that means the interface that's associated with big auto sales need to be a part of that same network. So it'll be 194.1.0. We can say dot two. It could be anything other than dot one, because you can't have create a conflict, right? And it cannot be 255 because that's the broadcast address. So we'll make this uh, dot two. And what's a good subnet amount? Be the same subnet mass that's assigned to uh, the ISP. Okay. And we should have uh, green lights. We have green lights. So now let's just go ahead and check uh, connectivity. So I'll uh, go into the router. And we'll ping the ISP. Okay. We have success. Four successes. So we have connectivity. Why does it say 80 percent? Why does it say 80 percent? Is because uh, if the sending device does not get a response on a certain amount of time, it's going to time out, and you'll see that dot there. And the reason they time out is because it has something to do with the process known as ARP, and we'll talk about that a little later. Okay, now that uh, we've assigned an IP address to the outside interface, we need to concentrate on the inside interface, which will be uh, F0 slash 1. What's a good IP address for this particular interface? Let's go back to our handy-dandy chart. We see that we've been assigned 194.1.2.0, right? Mm -hmm. So an appropriate IP address for this interface mm -hmm. is 194.1.2.0. One, this is going to be the default gateway for all of the devices inside, right? Generally, you want to assign the um, lowest IP address or the highest IP address to the default gateway. Because if you did an IP config for the computers in this room, you'll see that the default gateway address is 172.30.213.254. Okay. Right, that, it'll help for everybody to remember what it is. Yeah. Okay. And of course, appropriate subnet mask would be a slash 24 in this instance. So we have the uh, default gateway established, right? Okay. Now let's concentrate on the other devices. Looks like we have uh, like 10 computers here. Okay. Let's go ahead and assign IP addresses to these computers. Okay. What's a good IP address for this computer? It has to be on the same network as the default gateway, right? 194.1.2.2, good subnet mass. What about the default gateway address? That's the one we just configured, okay. That one, that two, that one, okay. All right. Let's do a connectivity test. Let's make sure we have connectivity to the default gateway. Okay, good to go. Now, you just ping the gateway. Just ping the gateway. But you use a command prompt through the desktop. Command prompt through the desktop. Which? That's right. We're not using the router. We're not using the router. Whichever desktop is quick on whichever device. Right. Uh huh. Yep, you're good to go. Um, notice as I configure a device, I'm ensuring connectivity as I go along. Imagine what could happen if I didn't ensure that the router had connectivity to the ISP and went on to the PC, configured the PC with an IP address, pinged the default gateway, and, lit and left the job site. Maybe two days later, the users are complaining that they can't access the internet. Whose fault would that have been? Mine, right, okay. Okay, let's go on to, P to the next PC. IP configuration, 
194.1.2.3, okay. Mm -hmm. Subnet mask. Hold on. All right. Okay. Let's test connectivity here. Let's ping 194.1.2.2, which is the other PC, the first PC we configured. All right. Let's let's just ensure we can ping the default gateway. We should, because we were able to do so from the other PC. All right. Let's take this a step farther. Let's um, see if we can ping the ISP. Now we're actually going outside of the network. We're going through the default gateway. Uh, what's a good what's the IP address? Okay, zero dot can be zero dot zero. That's a network address. The problem is, remember, um, if we go back to Chapter 5, routers must know about remote networks, and they'll learn about remote networks one of two ways, either statically or dynamically. We can get the packet to our default gateway, and our default gateway is aware of the 94.1 network because it's directly connected. It's, it's sending it to the appropriate router, which is the ISP, but the ISP knows nothing about the source. It can't get the packet back. So that's why we're not getting a response. Let's see if we can fix that. Okay, I'll go into uh, the CLI interface and I'm going to create a static route. And this is in the Beagle router. The network is 194.1.2.0. And it's going to, uh, the, the next hop is 194.1.0.2. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. We'll try the ping, and we see that it works this time, right? So he just did that. That added it to the uh, Beagle routing table. Yep. I use IP route command. That's beyond what we're talking about here. But we're going to get to that maybe, if not chapter 11 of this semester, we'll definitely get into it in uh, Net 126. Okay. With the IP route command. Okay. Yep. okay. We're going to go ahead and assign an IP address to uh, the next PC. All right, so we have the hang of this now, right? Okay, what's a good IP address? 94.1.2.4 be fine. Okay, let's not use the default gateway this time. Okay, let's just let's let's do an experiment. Okay, let's ping 194.1.2.1. One. Should we have success? Oh, we're gonna, yeah, we're using logic based upon the facts that we just learned, right? We're going to ping something on the same local area network, so it should work. What about pinging the, IP, the uh, ISP? No, What's that? Why, can't, why will it not ping the ISP? It can't get out of the network. It can't get out of the network because... Oh, it does not have a default gateway. Let's test that theory. Cannot get out. We'll get back. We'll get back to that. <laughs> I'm just checking on this right now. All right. Yeah. Let's we'll leave that one alone. Okay. It's not going to work. So we need to go ahead and put it on the default gateway. I'm having a hard time remembering all the numbers where you just put them out and get them. Well, um, so we can get outside of the network now. So once you set this, 
All right, now I'm not going to flesh this out by putting IP addresses in all of these PCs because that's kind of redund too redundant. Okay. To you guys' question, why would you want to segment your network? For security reasons, you may want to separate the business department from sales and marketing. Right. You can shut parts down to do updates, and, uh, and certain parts don't need to have access to other parts. And also, you want to limit broadcast. Because, you know, if I were to go into one of these machines and send a broadcast, the, let's say if I go into uh, PC1, and uh, let's see if this will work. 255.255.255.255. Go into simulation mode. Go to the PC. Press enter. To do a capture for the packet will go to the switch, and from the switch, it's going where? To so all the PCs, including the router. Okay, and we talked there earlier that PCs broadcast from time to time for various reasons. So, in, in essence, that takes a bandwidth. Okay. All right, we want to segment our organization. Okay. That will require us to activate more than one interface on the router, right? Because routers. Uh, segment broadcast domains, break up broadcast, right? Mm -hmm. But in previous sessions, we learned that no two or more interfaces on the same router can be a part of the same yeah. network, yeah. right? No two or more interfaces on the same router can be a part of the same network, right? However, we've been given 194.1.2.0 as the space that we could use to do anything we want to within our local area network, right? Okay. With that said, and considering that we're dealing with a 24-bit subnet mask, that means how many bits are available for host addresses? Eight bits. To determine how many hosts we can have on our network, all we do is two to the eighth power, right? Will give us how what value? 256, but we can't use two of those values because one is the network address and the other is the broadcast address. So we just, we really have 254. So we can't have more than 254 um, devices on this particular network. But we've decided we need to break this network up. So how do we do it? How can we make this happen? We have to increase the network bits. We have to get into something known as subnetting. Okay. Before we get to that, I want to take a look at our router. And let's so okay, we have two interfaces on the router. Um, the boss has given us a call and said that he wants us to create four networks, right? We can't create four networks on this router with two interfaces. So we need to increase the interfaces, right? So let's go ahead and um, see what our options are. Okay, here's a, a module with 16 Ethernet interfaces. Uh, let's see if we can plug that, that module into that expansion bay. It's probably not going to allow us because the device is powered on. Let's power down the device. Okay, let's go ahead and plug in the module. Power up the device. Okay, it's still booting. All right, it's up, and look at what we have. We have additional interface. Okay, we've gone from having only F0 slash 0, F0 slash 1 to 1 slash et cetera, right? And we talked earlier as, as to how we come up with that first one because that, that card we recently inserted went into expansion bay 1, okay? So this is the card that's put in the router? This is a card that's put on a router, and we can do the same with the routers that we have in the classroom. All right. So oh, it what says right there at the bottom, you know, 16 provides 16 switch and four. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. We have a, a new requirement. What's the requirement? To go from one local area network to how many? 
We need to have four. Uh -huh. The boss says that she wants four. Okay. All right, so we have to do some subnetting. We have to break this 194.1.2.0 into four networks. No, I'm, I'm going to give you the process. Okay. All right, you have the uh, subnet, uh, subnetting steps that we downloaded from Moodle. And we're going to reference that as we go along. Okay. The original network is 194, 1, 2, 0, subnet mass 255, 255, 255, 0. So slash 24, right? Okay. Okay, first step is to determine the required networks. How many networks do we need? Four. Okay. Now, looking at the subnet mask, how many bits are used for network? How many network bits are there? 24 of them. Eight bits are used for hosts. Okay, in order for us to create additional networks, we're going to have to do something known as borrowing network bits or borrowing host bits and converting them to network bits. So we've determined that we need four networks. Then the next step, according to the steps, uh, indicates that we need to determine the leaf in value of the formula 2n that satisfies the above requirement. So 2 to what power will create 4? 2, right? So n equals 2. That tells us the amount of bits that we need to borrow, right? All right. Okay, we're back. All right. The first thing we should do is, um, you know, after determining those requirements, is we need to separate or, or make some type of demarcation that distinguishes the network bits from host bits. Originally, we had 24 network bits, right? So we'll count one, two, three, four. We know there are eight in this octet, eight in the next octet eight in the third octet, right? That was the original, this was the original demarcation. We need to borrow how many host bits to additional? So we'll say the new, the, uh, new demarcation is here. And since I can't draw a line the way I normally would on the board, which we would generally draw a line here, I'll just uh, highlight that area to indicate that uh, the demarcation is here. So anything from this point on is now considered network bit. Okay? All right. We borrow two network bits or two host bits, and we've converted them to network bits. Okay? All right. If you look at the uh, instructions where it says calculate the new subnet mask, we know the new subnet mask is now going to be a slash 26. And that converts to 255, 255, 255, 192. Okay? And then uh, the next step, according to the subnet step, says uh, methodically calculate the subnet. Note that that's not really definitive, right? I'm going to show you a method, but you will probably develop your own method as time goes on, and most students do. Regardless of what method you use, make sure it is a method. And what does that mean? It stays the same, right? It doesn't adapt and change because when it changes, then chances are the, the answer that you should be providing is going to be wrong, okay? So keep it methodical. Come up with a method and stick with it, okay? Now, it doesn't mean you can't improve it. But just make sure whatever improvements you make, it's a method. Okay. All right. Okay. Each one of these rows on the chart will indicate a unique network. First thing we need to do during this uh, method here is determine the value of the first network. Okay. The easiest way to do it is to start by 
creating the least combination in terms of borrowed network bits, the least combination. And what am I talking about? We're going to start with zeros under the borrowed network bits, right? That in, those two zeros indicate that we're not using those values, okay? So uh, we can now um, understand that the, this network address is going to be 94.1.2, because again, these three octets will be the same. What's going to be the value in the third octet? Dot zero. The reason we know it's going to be zero because we're not using any additional network bits in that particular octet, and plus, we've automatically converted all of the host bits to zero. All right? This is a key um, tidbit that you need to be aware of. All zeros in the host bit portion will be, will convert to the network address. All zeros in the host bit portion means network address. All zeros in the host bit portion means network address. Okay? Okay. In order for us to get this network address, which is 194.1.2.0, we have to assume that all of the host bits are not used, right? Because if we were to turn on any host bit, then we no longer will have all zeros in the host bit portion. We no longer have the network address, okay? All right, let's find the uh, broadcast address. How do we find the broadcast address? Basically, what we'll do is turn on all the host bits. Okay, we turn on all the network bits. Now we add the value of those bits. What do we get? So we know the first the first octet is going to be 194, second one will be one, and the third one will be two. What's the value of the third octet? 32 plus 16 8 4 it's going to give us a value of 63. Okay. The earlier rule stated that all zeros in the host bit will mean network address. All ones in the host bit area will mean broadcast address. Okay? You're with us so far, right? Okay, we have a question. What is the... All right. Okay, remember um, I mentioned to determine the value of the first network, if it's network zero, the first network, we had to not use the, the network bits because we're starting with the lowest combination in the, net, in the borrowed network bit portion. That would have to mean all zeros there. And now in order to determine the value of the next network, we go to the next least combination of network bits borrowed. What would that be? We can't use double zeros again. That's played out. The next least would be oh, okay, zero. zero, one. Okay? Now, we're going to assume that all of the host bits are off, and we need to determine the value of this particular network. It's going to be 194.1.2. What's the value of this octet? 64. To find the broadcast address, what do we do? Turn on all the host bits. And the host bits are from this point to the right. Okay? It's making some sense. So what's the broadcast address for this particular network? 194.1.2. What is it? How'd you get 127, Chris? 
Yeah, you added up the value of all the ones in that octet, right? Okay, so it's 127. Okay, so we've uh, created two networks so far, right? The requirement is four networks, right? Okay. How do we determine the value of the next network? Okay, we've started with the least combination, then the next least combination. Now we need to go to the next least combination in terms of borrowed network bits. It couldn't be 1, 1 because that shoots us all the way up to 192. So it'll be uh, 1, 0, right? 1, 0 gives us what value there? 128, right? 194.1.2.128. Notice the pattern here. We start with 0 to 63. The broadcast address for the first network is 63. Then the next network address is going to be one increment away, which is 64. The broadcast address for the 64 network is 127. Then the next network is going to be one increment away, which is 128. Okay? And we, we, uh, we, we got 128 based upon the fact of turning all of the host bits to zero. Because all zeros in the host bit will equal network address. Right? To turn to find a broadcast address, what must we do? All ones in the host portion. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, we're flipping the bits. Okay, 194.1.2, and what's the value of this octet now? Two fifty five minus sixty four. That's that's neat. So what's that? One ninety one. Okay, because we're going in increments of sixty four, right? Okay. All right. Now what's the value of the next one ninety two? Yeah, because we see we ended with one ninety one here. So we need to go to 192, and we make 192 by turning on the 128 and 64 bits. Notice we've also maxed out the borrowed network bits. Then that indicates that we're done with subnetting. We cannot go any further, okay? With, now, unless we subnet the subnet, which you can do, and we'll do that a little later. Okay, what's, the, what's this network address? 194.1.2. One ninety two. So we stopped at one ninety one at the previous network, so this network will be one ninety two. To determine the broadcast address, we need to turn on all of the host bits. And we get one ninety four dot one dot two dot two fifty five. We maxed it out. All right, now let's go back to Packet Tracer and apply what we've created here. This is where it gets a little tricky. Okay, we have a question. What's the question? I'm, I'm waiting for first gear and we'll go. Okay, we need to create um, four networks, right? So we can't do it with, with this link. That's one network. Let's go ahead and I'll lose this particular uh, link. All right. Let's um, let's disconnect some of these PCs from the switch because we need to associate some of them with other networks. Okay, we'll leave three PCs on this particular network. Let's uh, pull out the cables. All right. Uh, let's Attach the switch. We use port F0 slash 1. I'm going to use those new interfaces that we connected. So let's use the ones, okay? Now let's go back to the router. I'm going to say the IP addresses have been cleared from the other interfaces. I'm going to activate this interface. All right. 
I'm going to have to use the command line to actually input the IP address. They didn't provide GUI for this one. So, yeah. What's a good IP address for this particular network? We go back to our chart. We'll start with the first network, which is the zero network, right? So basically, we can assign an IP address from anywhere within this range of 0 through 63. But we can't use 0 and we can't use 63, right? So we're going to use 1. So 194.1.2.1. And what's the subnet mask? 192 is the new subnet mask. Okay. Yeah. Now let's see what's going on. Okay, the router didn't like that module, so we're going to have to lose that module. Let's try a different module. Yeah, we had to lose the 16 port module. And um, we, we added another module that had two Ethernet ports. And we had two prior to uh, changing the module. So that gives us four ports. And that will satisfy four networks, right? OK, let's um, make sure that we have uh, some connectivity, which we don't because we deleted the port. So let's connect the, again, let's connect the switch to one of those ports. Wow, that's still a problem. Okay, and the reason we have a problem now is because although we have four ports, one of those ports on the router is connected to the ISP. So we've got to come up with a different solution. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're, All right we're, we're going to try this uh, for Ethernet, see how that works well, how, for us. Well, we see the description here where it says uh, 4E features four Ethernet ports. Mm -hmm. Yep. So what was the difference between that and the switching? Well, the switching ports didn't allow the assignment of IP addresses. Uh -huh. so, so basically, all of those 16 ports will be a part of the same network. Right. Uh, and, uh, you can say that with a router. Yeah. Well, right. In this instance, then we will, have, in essence, convert that router to something similar to what you have at home, where some of your ports are routed ports, and then the other ports on that device will be switched ports. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's connect the. Uh, let's try this again. Let's go with the switch to the router. Let's use one of these uh, slower ports, the Ethernet ports. Okay. We're going to assign an IP address. We'll use an Ethernet 1 slash 0. The good IP address is 194.1.2.1. And the subnet mask is 255.255.255. And we've subnetted, so we've changed the original subnet mask. And the, the modified subnet mask is 194 or 192. It's getting a little late. All right. And we need to activate the interface. If we don't, we won't get a green light. So we'll activate the interface. The green light comes up. And we'll talk more about the amber light later. OK, so we've created one network, right? Now let's go ahead and assign IP addresses to the PCs associated with this new default gateway. Let's go into this particular PC. And a good IP address, can we use dot two? OK, Bob says yes. And yeah, because it's within the range of this particular network. The range is from zero through sixty-three. We've used one. So yeah, we can use we can leave it there. But what about the default gateway address? Can we use that? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, because that is the de the default gateway. Okay. So basically, the IP addresses associated with these first three PCs are appropriate for this particular network, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just verifying. Let's 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 do a connectivity verification. Um, yeah, dot one dot two dot one is the default gateway. We've got 
got not getting the default gateway. Let's do some troubleshooting. Oh, okay. So we have to go back and correct the sub that mask. Okay, the 192 is the appropriate sub uh, subnet mask for this particular network. With that said, we need to do uh, make an adjustment to the first PC. So and we see that um, there's logic to this process. Now, it's not a, it's not in a, a, a random occurrence. There's a particular order for, for everything that goes on here, right? Okay. Let's uh, configure this PC. We need to change the subnet mask. Okay. And we should be able to ping one of the other PCs, right? And we can. We should be able to ping the default gateway, and we can. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, configure another network. Okay. All right. We'll just uh, have two PCs on this particular network. Let's go from the switch to the router. I'm using the other another one of those E ones. Okay. We need to configure it. So we'll go to E1 slash 1. What's a good IP address for this network? Can we use 194.1.2.5? We can't. The router is saying no because that range belongs to that first network. Okay? So we have to go back to our chart to look at the next network. It's the 64 network. So we can use any range, any value between 64 and 127. Yeah, since this will be the default gateway, we want to use the lowest IP address in the range, okay, or the highest. And since we use the lowest in regards to the first network, let's just continue that pattern. So this will be dot 65, and the router likes it. We'll turn the interface on. Okay, let's go back to Packet Tracer. All right, and let's configure IP addresses. Okay, help me out here. 194.1.2.66. Okay, can, why can't I use five? It's in the other network. We have to stick with the appropriate uh, values for this network. So we could use 66, right? Subnet mask. The router wants to, well, the, this PC wants to give us the, what's known as the default gateway. It sees 194, not default gateway, sorry, that's default subnet mask. Because if you look at some of the other videos, you see that there's something known as the default subnet mask. So value of 194, the default subnet mask is going to be a class C, which would be 255, 255, 255. So we're extending it, and we're going to make it a 192. Uh, what about a default gateway? It'll be the 65. What would happen if we put dot one here? Let's do a test. Let's do a test. Let's um, put in the appropriate default gateway. Okay. Let's ping the default gateway just to ensure we have connectivity. It works. Okay. Let's ping a remote network, which would be a 194. Dot, which is a PC in another network, 1.2.2. Is that good? It's working. Why, why is it working? Because both networks are attached to that router. That router knows both networks, okay? All right. All right, let's go back and change the default gateway. Let's let's create an error here. Let's put in the wrong default gateway, which would be dot one, right? Is it going to work this? Is the ping going to work this time? Still working? All right, 
Let me explain something to you here. In the real world, that will not work. Okay? <laughs> Trust me, that will not work. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> that's a bug. That's a package trace of bug. You should get a bunch of timeouts in the real world, okay? Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah, just just know for future reference, if you get in a situation where you create a subnet and then um, you find that some devices don't contact remote networks, you you want to ensure that you're using the appropriate default gateway for that particular subnet. Okay. All right, let's create an additional network. I'm going to move this over and try to keep it organized. Connect uh, PC to switch. PC to switch. Usually use copper cables when you switch to PC. If it's Ethernet, it's going to be copper. Well, if it's copper Ethernet, it's going to be copper because there's also uh, they get into like fiber Ethernet and, and such. So. All right. Um, okay, we need to go from the switch. And notice I'm leaving uh, port zero slash one available on each of these switches for connection to the router. That's the method that I started with the first switch, and I'm just continuing that process. And you will want to do this when you build your network. So whenever you need to do some troubleshooting, you you automatically know, okay, port zero slash one is going to the router. And that's the main trunk um, link. Okay. Now I could use any other port and it'll work just fine, but it just will be a nightmare, yeah, later on. Yep. You want to write it down anyway. You want to write it down anyway. You want documentation. Okay, let's turn this interface on. And what's a good IP address for this? 1.2.68. Huh? It's got to be a value between 128 and 191. Okay. So this would be a one, can't be 128, right? Because that's the network address. 129. Okay. Have a good uh, subnet mask. All right, let's configure the IP address on the PC. 92.1.2.130. Okay, and there's that default subnet mask. We need to modify it. What's the default gateway address? 129. It's the IP address of the closest router. Okay. A closest routing interface. All right. One nine each four dot one dot two dot one ninety. One ninety? Yeah, we can use one ninety. Just can't use one ninety one. Yeah. Okay. What's the default gateway address? 129. Okay, let's do a connectivity test. Let's. When you do a connectivity test, you want to ensure that you can communicate within your local area network before you start stretching out. Okay. And the reason I say that is because if I attempted to ping the ISP and didn't get a success, then I don't know where the problem is. The problem could be the PC. It could be the default gateway. You know, it, it could be anywhere between that PC and that remote uh, device. Let's make sure we want to get we have connectivity inside. 130. Okay, we're experiencing a problem. Let's do some troubleshooting. Okay, we got we have a typo. We have a typo. That's probably really easy to do. Yeah, it's easy to do. 
is generally when you're building a network, you're looking up diagrams. And I'm trying to kind of do this, which is no excuse because we're only dealing with a few values here. So. Charts and diagrams. Yep. Okay, now let's try a connectivity test and we get success. All right, so we do have communication within the uh, local area network. All right, so we have one more net network to create, right? But we will run out of switches. Let's go get another switch. We're going to use the 2960, which is what we use in the classroom. Okay, and let's get some cables. Go to the router. Alrighty. Okay, let's configure the router. Turn the interface on so we get green light. 194. What's a good value for this network? 1.2.192? 1 1.193. 1.193. 2 That's the network address. Yeah, we go back to the chart. We yeah, see that's the network address. And do 194.1.2.193. Okay, appropriate subnet mask. All right. Okay, let's go to a PC. All right, we'll watch for typos this time, right? Good IP address. What's a good host address now? 194. Okay, let's change the default subnet mask to 192. And we do need a default gateway, right? Especially if we want to communicate with remote networks. 93. Okay. So we need to sign an IP address to this PC. Again, we're pulling from this range, which is uh, 192 to 255. We can't use the first and we can't use the last. You'd be marking off each address and you'll sign like this. You'd, you'd be marking off each address. And it's not a exactly. Yeah, you mark as you go. But in the real world, we wouldn't do this statically. We'd create a DHCP server and have it assign the IP addresses. Okay. Right, 194.1.2.1. Oh, well, let me say, can we do two something? Mm -hmm. 20? 220? Yeah. 194.1.2.193 is the default gateway. Okay, let's do a connectivity test. Let's ping the default gateway. And we have success. Let's try a remote network. This is a PC in the first network that we created, right? And we have success. We have a local area network connectivity and we can communicate with devices outside of the local area network. Okay, now you see the essence of subnetting, right? Okay. Um, okay, why do we have to subnet? Because we want to create additional networks based upon the original network address space that we had, right? In order to create additional networks, we can't spread that original network space, which is just 194.1.2.0 across multiple routing interfaces, especially if we're using the slash 24. But that will put all of those interfaces on the same network. So we have to change the network address by manipulating what? The host bits and the subnet mask. Okay. All right. Now, in this example, we use the steps to determine how many networks are required. Then we determine the least end value and the 2N formula to satisfy four networks. You would use the same process if the requirement were 15 networks or eight networks. 
the steps will be the same. But of course, if you're trying to satisfy eight networks, you're going to have eight rows opposed to four. And your network ranges will be smaller. The more networks you create, the more, uh, well, the, the smaller the ranges become. Okay? And, and look at it from this perspective, too. Before we manipulated the original network, when we were just dealing with the slash 24, what were the um, amount of host addresses? Or what was the amount of them for the host address? 255, but we could use 254, right? Yes. All right. Now, notice when we created four networks, we lost two during the first network we created because we can't use the zero and we can't use the 63. So we lost two values, two host addresses. Then when we created the second, we lost another two. So each time you subnet, you're going to lose host addresses. Okay? All right. So subnet, subnetting comes at a cost. All right? Any questions about anything we've talked about so far? Hold on. Brian had a question. Actually, Brian had a few questions. The real mechanics that you need to be aware of from C is all zeros and the host portion will equate to network address, all ones broadcast address. If you have that concept down, when we get to subnetting class A's and B's, you'll get it. If you don't have that concept, it'll be crazy. Okay. And usually on your demarcation line here, uh, you know, if it was 32, you would have uh, you have eight subnets here, and they would all have a range of about 32. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, I, um, in terms of class C, you can use that method. And I've taught students in the past, if you're just submitting a class C, you're going to borrow three bits, for example. You can use the value of the lowest bit borrow. In that instance, it would be the 32. And then your network will be increments of 32, okay. starting with zero will be the first network. Then you go up to the next network will be, again, increments of 32. The next network will be 32, 64, and so forth, OK? If you borrow five bits, then the, the value of the lowest bit borrowed in this instance would be eight. So it be increments of eight. The first network is zero. Second network is dot eight. The third network dot 16. That works fine for class C, but you can't do that with class A and class B. That's why I'm teaching you the long form here, OK? All right. You know, if you can find out the network and the broadcast and the, the first available and the, the last available, then you got it with. You got that in the, in the next yep. uh, network. Right. Yeah, you see, the, you know, this, you know, networking is. Uh, yeah. But you see, networking is complex. Yeah. And you, you kind of get a glimpse in, into why people who work in this industry can get paid really, really well, because this isn't something that the average person is willing to sacrifice time to learn. It takes a lot to learn, but once you get it and you get that job, you can be really rewarded. Okay. 